Truth Barista is a production of High Beam Ministry and uses the imaginary Airzatz Coffee Shop as its platform to bring you a conversation about a plethora of scintillating topics. We don't shy away from any issue that is plaguing our culture or the church today, whether it's current cultural issues, questions about Bible verses, or even just some banter to encourage you. Dr. Jay Christensen is the Truth Barista, and he and amazing Larry Kutzler brew up highly caffeinated conversations for our day. Grab a cup of joe, pop yourself down in the booth next to us, and get ready to think. The Truth Barista is a production of High Beam Ministry, and it's listener-supported. For more information about The Truth Barista, go to highbeamministry.com. Thanks for listening. In Matthew 7, Jesus warned his disciples about false prophets, and he said that they would come in sheep's clothing. Don't miss what Jesus said. Wolves in the church don't look like wolves. They look like sheep. In Jude's description, he's made the character of these people very plain, but they won't. They will be greedy, but they'll tithe to confuse you. They'll show themselves to be loving, but it's really to earn your trust or conceal their motives. They'll sound humble, they'll sound meek, but humility is not a tone of voice. It's a heart posture that shows up and how you live. So pay attention to if they're actually teachable. Pay attention to if they have anybody in their circle that can challenge them. Pay attention to if they submit to authority, but usually these kinds of teachers will position themselves as leaders so that they can conveniently be the authoritative one just like Korah. They will come off as pure. They'll even write books about sexual immorality, but they'll walk in it the whole time. Sadly today, many want answers, but few want the truth. Why? Because answers don't demand action. Answers don't expect us to change how we live. Truth does. And the surest truth we have is God's truth found in the Bible. God's truth sets the course by which we are to set the direction of our lives in a world filled with answers that point in all directions. But there's only one sure direction, God's truth. The Truth Barista will bring you conversation every week that presents a relevant truth as stimulating as a good cappuccino. The Truth Barista is hosted by Dr. Jay Christensen, founder of High Beam Ministry. For more information about this program, check out highbeamministry.com. Dr. Jay Christensen, it's so nice to sit across the table from you once again because I know you're chomping at the bit. I know you are to get back into this itsy bitsy book that we've been studying called Jude. That's right. It's a lot of material in a very tidy book. It's a phenomenal book it, it, and it really applies a lot to our day just as much as it applied in the first century because we're facing the same issues that Jude was facing amongst the early believers, that there are people who are getting off base, they're false teachers, and the problem is they're not just false teachers, but their lives aren't living up to what they're teaching and they're leading people astray. I mean, it is a mess. And Jude starts off by saying, hey guys, I wanted to write you a letter about you know encouraging you and blah, 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 but now... What's come to my attention is all this garbage, so now I'm going to address this. And that's the bulk of his letter, is addressing the garbage. You know, and I've learned something, even though we didn't cover this in conversation, but I I picked it up as I was reading and listening to what you were saying, is that in the opening verses, it talks about that that people crept in unnoticed. And, And people being unnoticed, they sort of spread like gangrene. And it reminds me that sin is never neutral. Sin is never passive. Sin is always aggressive moving and moving. So when something like sin creeps in unnoticed, it takes a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And sooner or later, the whole community is infiltrated with their doctrine or their evil. Right. And it's not just the entire community, which is what Jude is addressing, but even for a believer too, when our lusts and our desires, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, as First John says, opens the door to permit our desires to move us and do things and say things against 
God's way, against God's will, against God's moral code. Once you crack that door a little bit, it's easier to keep going and keep going. So it's on a, both a personal and a congregational or community level. A number of years ago, we started talking about, as a culture, about being tolerant. And everyone's, oh yeah, you got to be tolerant. Well, we were tolerant and in crept all kinds of things. And now look at the kind of society we have. We live in an immoral, very dark society because the tolerance has just spread like gangrene. And pretty soon, everywhere you look, I just uh, heard this week from Washington, you know, they've got legislation that's protecting certain immoral behavior, which means basically, Dr. J, that you and I will not be able to preach anything against any kind of, of moral sin. People that live immorally will be a protected species. So I see some real serious problems today, but it comes out of an example here, right in Jude, this itsy bitsy book we're talking about. Right. And what's interesting is, you and I've often talked about in the past that you know, where people have said, hey, let's consider this option. So people who say, for example, like homosexuality, let's consider the normalcy of this option. Okay, let's tolerate this option. Okay, let's celebrate this option. Okay, let's heavily promote this option. Okay, now we're going to make sure you do that this option is now set in stone yeah. that we must all accept and it's crazy mm -hmm. how it goes and what's funny is it doesn't just want to find a space mm -hmm. it wants to push out anything that opposes it mm -hmm. which is exactly what you just talked about sin issues such as homosexuality and various aberrations in marriage and other moral acts are advancing it's pushing out it can't stand having any sort of conviction or condemnation of those things. And yet, when you look at the book of Jude, there is heavy duty condemnation against the things that these people are doing. Jude doesn't pull any punches on them. He just smacks them right between the spiritual eyes and says, you guys are doing it wrong. This is how you do it. All right. So shall we jump in and do a little bit of kind of refresher? Yeah, let's do it. Go ahead. You've read through the book. I've read the, through the book. Uh, we've gone up to, I think, verses eight. So verses one and two are the introduction and the believers standing with God. And in verses three through four, Jude presents the danger of false teachers, that they're actively at work in the community and a very sneaky heretics because <laughs> they're trying to get in there and, and get their views kind of woven into the community. Now, when you go through five and seven, Jude begins to talk about God's judgment of sin. And he uses three illustrations in here, which are interesting because it's those who rebelled during the Exodus, those angels that rebelled against God. And then he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, the Gentiles that rebelled against God's moral code. And he basically says, you know, folks, God judged all these things. So don't think that you're going to escape judgment or they're going to escape judgment as sinners promoting these things. You rebel against God, you are going to get judged. That's the plain, simple fact. And that brings us up to verse 8, the wickedness of false teachers. And that's where we'll do a little bit of rehash over last week's study, if that's okay? Sure. Okay. So let's look at uh, verse 8 through 10 quickly. In the same way, and I'm reading out of the Christian Standard Bible on here, I also recommend the English Standard Version or the New King James Version simply because they're a little bit more literal, and I like a little more literal than too much paraphrase here. So, in the same way these people, relying on their dreams, defile their flesh, reject authority, and slander glorious ones. Yet when Michael, the archangel, was disputing with the devil in an argument about Moses' body, he did not dare utter a slanderous condemnation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme anything they don't understand. And what they do understand by instinct, like irrational animals, by these things, they are destroyed. Okay. Hmm. Is there anything in there that catches your attention or seems weird to you or whatever? Wow. I, the whole thing is just, you know, <laughs> in your face, right? And I mean, it just shows you that the arrogance of man, pride, ego, wickedness, self-destructing behavior is is rampant. And they're obviously rejecting God and they're living onto themselves. I mean, that's the right. first thing I see. Okay. Well, let's start in verse 8. It's the dreamers. What does he mean by relying on their dreams? They've created their own teachings. They've dreamed up 
their own teachings. And basically, verse 8 through 10 is highlighting these heretical teachers' opposition to authority, God's authority. So, in other words, these dreamers teach what's false, the things they've dreamed up. And by the way, you and I are both very familiar with some of the really strange teachings of today, right? There are some Bible teachings where wrong is right, and right is wrong. What God says is right, some, I hate to say it, some so-called Christian air quote teachers out there are saying, no, no, God may have said that, but this is what it really means, and therefore it gives us license to do it. And I don't necessarily know if I want to walk on that kind of thin ice, uh, if you know what I mean. Well, in the dreamers, they kind of, like you say, dream up their own thinking, and they just do what they want to do. I mean, uh-huh. that's, what, that's what it says here. they defiling the flesh and rejecting authority and blaspheming the glorious ones. I don't care what anybody else said before me. I got the answers today. I'm going to live according to my plan and according to what I want. And everyone else can just, you know, take a flying leap. Yep. Well, and by the way, here's a parallel example of what's going on today. Not only is Jude talking about heretical teachers, teachers who have gone too far and dream things up, but even in our day, and you have to understand this, I do believe that God releases prophets today, people who hear him, and he has called to share forthtelling and even occasionally predict foretelling things that, you know, that have come directly from God. There are genuine prophetic voices today. However, there are a lot of people who claim to have a prophetic word or claim to be prophets, frankly, who strike me as having just dreamed up what God has given or what they say God has given them. How can you tell? Well, number one, if it's foretelling and it doesn't come to pass, that was dreamed up. Mm-hmm. If it's forth-telling, speaking into the situation, and it doesn't line up with God's Word, or on a spiritual discernment level, you're listening to Him and it kind of goes clunk in your spirit, you know, I would put that stuff to the side if it goes clunk in your spirit, but if it doesn't line up with God's Word, you should immediately reject that. There are people who dream these things up, and sadly, even some prophets trying to make a buck today or trying to make a name for themselves steal words from one another, and so these dream things seem to proliferate through the body, and this dreamed up stuff then becomes, thus saith the Lord, why? Because all the prophets are saying it. Well, the prophets for profit are saying it, (laughs) but are the real prophets saying it? We need to do some really good research and look at the track record of the prophets who are speaking. Look at the track records of the teachers who are teaching. Do they stand the test of time? Do they stand examination? And that's what Jude is saying right here. He's, He's looked at them and he says, nah, they don't measure up. Well, and I think that, Dr. J, that part of the problem, too, is that we have weak congregations because people will be like sheep and they'll follow these dreamers and they don't give it a second thought. But it seems to me that, that Paul and the apostles were trying to teach the flock, the congregations, to discern and to, to understand truth and to not allow you know, the wolves that he talked about coming into Ephesus after he left to, to identify them. And a lot of times our congregations are so, I don't know, weak or, or ignorant or lazy, but they don't challenge the dreamers. They let the dreamers dream, and pretty soon that dream becomes encased in the entire ministry, and it slowly gets off base from God. Well, like people say, you tell a lie often enough and it becomes the truth. Right. And the other thing, too, is a good defense is a good offense. So when we learn God's word and somebody starts talking stuff like hyper grace, you know, God forgives. Actually, God will allow you to continue in sin because he loves you and has grace for you. We know he has love and grace for us to forgive us when we confess and repent. But the hyper grace movement overlooks the confess and repent part. Or there's weird angelic stuff people talk about. Teachings that reinforce abuse of authority, non-biblical Jewish roots type legalism or Christian mysticism goes off track. These types of things God will deal with that will lead to other things in our lives, such as the question, this is what the teachers are teaching, so what do these false teachers do? And now getting back into Jude, this is where we're getting into the fourth triad of Jude, because he writes these things in sets of three. They defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries or spiritual authorities, or in my text it says slandering glorious ones. So what does all that mean and what's the relationship? 
Well, this goes back to the original two charges Jude levels against these teachers. They're rejecting God's authority, and they're creating teachings that allow for immorality. They, it excuses it. And by the way, this last one, speaking evil of dignitaries or slandering glorious ones, in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, you know, it's often said, and to the angel of the church of Ephesus, to the angel of the church of Smyrna or Pergamum, right? He's not talking about angels because these congregations aren't led by angels. This angel, the word means messenger. Who is the messenger in the church of Ephesus? That would be either the pastor or the elder who's doing the sharing or the teaching within that body. So in other words, to the one who speaks to the body in Ephesus, tell them this. To the one who speaks to the church or the congregation in Pergamum, say this. Right, so when it talks here about slandering glorious ones, it could be talking about genuine angels, which is kind of weird. Another approach would be to those who slander the spiritual authorities in churches. And having been involved in pastoral ministry for over 25 years, you sometimes get people who come into the congregation and you're not teaching their hottest spiritual idea, and they start ripping you because uh, you're just unaware and ignorant of the truth of what God has revealed to me. And I'm not saying that pastors know everything, but there comes a point when a pastor says, yeah, that's not on base, and these people will start slandering them. When we start talking about church splits, it's because two people or leaders within a congregation can't get along. Well, that doesn't bode well, I don't think, to the world, saying that leadership in Christ can't get along, they can't serve one another and work things out, instead of splitting up the congregation, and that just makes things so ugly. But that's what it's where it starts. They start slandering the one who is teaching. Well, he's not good enough. He's not teaching the whole Word of God. And so the next thing you know, the whole group of people walk out the door down the street to start another church. Exactly. And it can be not just against the pastor or the lead elder, it could be against all of the leadership. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and of course, we're speaking in a situation where the leadership is actually on base with God and the accuser is off base. And that brings us into verse 9. Yet when Michael the archangel was disputing with the devil in an argument about Moses' body, he did not dare utter a slanderous, see there's a connection, condemnation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now let me explain this one a little bit because it's it's a, it's a little weird out of the frame of reference of most Christians. This Archangel Michael illustration is from an apocryphal book, which is an extra-biblical book. Didn't make it into the official scriptures, although we're going to see another apocryphal book mentioned by Jude that almost made it in because he referenced it. So this whole book he's talking about, this story is called The Assumption of Moses. Now, that doesn't mean that Moses assumed something about you know, God or somebody else. It means the assumption of Moses' body, the taking of Moses' body into heaven. Moses died on Mount Nebo, and his body was buried in an unknown location. And many rabbis say that was done on purpose so that people wouldn't use it as a shrine to worship Moses. However, we also see Moses show up at the transfiguration in Matthew 17. Therefore, as Elijah was bodily assumed or taken up into heaven, so people say, ah, when Moses died, he didn't really die. He was assumed or taken bodily into heaven. So he did make it to the promised land, but only at the time of the transfiguration. So that's the story is the assumption of Moses. Now, this is what the book says. Moses' body was to be buried in a location per God's intent. Satan fought to reveal Moses' body so it would be used, as I mentioned, as a shrine and draw people away from God. Michael, the archangel Michael, is said to have opposed Satan but chose to leave the judgment up to God. This is Jude's point. According to the New King James Version, it says, the reverence for the prerogatives of God stands in great contrast to the heretics who were slandering anyone and everyone. The heretics are doing what even Michael wouldn't do, speaking against authorities. That's how arrogant they are. And so there are two problems with these guys, these heretics. They don't know the truth of the gospel because they're not spiritual, and thus they speak against it. What they do understand 
according to Jude, is only on a natural, kind of a brute beast level. And this is what corrupts them. So think of this. How many people have tried to build spiritual kingdoms by human strength, human principles, human manipulations? Have you noticed how twisted spiritual things become when we do it in our own strength, according to our own plans? But then again, how many Christians have done great things for God by diligently working as he leads, as he opens doors, and he releases abilities? So what Jude is saying is these heretical teachers are teaching things according to their own thinking, the dreaming, and because of this, it's catering to the flesh, as opposed to those who are teaching according to God's word, which builds up the body. And this is what Jude is condemning them for, okay? Well, let me ask this. It sounds like a little bit like the parable of the wheat and the tares, doesn't it? Where Jesus, Very much so. Jesus said, let them be until the end, and then the angels will separate what is right and what is wrong. So sometimes I think we get sort of self-righteous and go, let's get them heretics. And we just create more problems with that than, than not. But it's hard not to stand against things that are being said that aren't true. Well, that's true. We do need to stand against it, and there comes a time when you need to excuse a heretic out of your assembly because of the damage they're doing, etc. That's the gatekeeper function, the shepherding function of making sure who can speak, who can't speak, and shepherds making sure they guard the flock against wolves. But what Jude is saying here is they're slandering authorities. Michael wouldn't slander authorities. He just left it over to God. So if these people disagree with an authority, they should just keep their mouths shut and say, well, we'll let, if I disagree with this pastor or this elder, I'll let the Lord deal with it. That's really, in essence, what Jude is saying. But no, you know, these heretics, I'm going to show that pastor and elder what's right here, and I'm going to go after them. And Jude says, and that's their problem. And that brings us to verse 11. Woe to them. And by the way, woe is a very interesting word when used in the scriptures because it's known as the woe of prophetic judgment. So when it says woe unto you, it's not a Shakespearean phrase. It's actually a specific idiom that says God curses these people for what they have done. And that's what he talks about. Woe to them. Why? For they have followed the way of Cain. They've plunged into Balaam's error for profit and have perished in Korah's rebellion. He actually describes the three things these people are doing by using three Old Testament examples. Okay, if you got anything that you want to well, throw I in Well, I like here? that. So those three are all the way of rebellion, though, right? I mean, they just were going the opposite direction that God was going. Can you say more about the way of Cain and the way of Balaam and Korah's uh. rebellion? They're examples of rebellion, just as you said. Now, you and I have often picked on Andy Stanley a bit. Now, he has some good things to say, but Charles Stanley, his father, really stood really firm on the entire Word of God. And yet, in recent years, we heard Andy Stanley say, well, we need to unhitch from the Old Testament and just stay with the New Testament. He's since gone back and kind of tempered his view a bit. But I do encounter Christians who say, we just need the New Testament, we don't need the Old. Well, if that's the case, you just stick with the New Testament, you don't have a darn idea of what Jude just said here in verse 11, because these three examples are firmly embedded in the Old Testament. So, what's the link here? Okay, They're all rebels against God. For Cain, he refused to believe God. That's pride and self-righteousness. Balaam sold his services out of greed, and Korah rebelled against authority out of his selfish ambition. Jude is describing what these heretics are doing. They have pride, they have self-righteousness, they're refusing to believe God and presenting their own dreams in place of God's word. They're working out of greed, they're selling their spiritual services for money or whatever, and as Korah did, they're rebelling against the local congregational authority by saying that their authority is over the leadership's authority. And boom, Jew just theologically body slams the heretics here. We'll finish up with this. These people are dangerous reefs at your love feasts as they eat with you without reverence. They are shepherds who look only after themselves, their waterless clouds carried along by the winds, trees in late autumn, fruitless, twice dead and uprooted. They are wild waves of the sea foaming up their shameful deeds, wandering stars for whom the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. Now, I'll unpack this the next time we get together, but I just want to end with this 
particular phrase here. They are spots at your love feasts or dangerous reefs. Dangerous reefs are at, is actually a really good translation of the Greek because it means a hidden reef. It looks like smooth sailing with these guys, but their teaching is so shallow and so dangerous, you'll run aground and you will go shipwrecked if you follow their teachings. They fearlessly serve only themselves. They're carousing instead of caring. And we'll talk about this again the next time we get together. Well, Dr. J, this is so good. Can you give us just a short little summary and how it applies to us today? In congregational life, we really do need the Holy Spirit's gift of discernment. My spiritual gifts classes and others that discernment is probably going to be the primary gift we need if we are in the end times. What is discernment? It's being able to distinguish between two things. Is something genuine? Is it not? Now, I have a couple of thoughts about that. Number one, when it's talking about discernment, we need to discern, as in the case of Jude, what these people are teaching. Is it lined up with God's Word or is it not? If it is with God's Word, then we need to embrace it and we need to walk it out. That brings me to the second part. We need discernment because the words the person may be saying are correct, but is their lifestyle lining up with it? So the first one is discerning, teaching God's Word, and the second one is about lifestyle, Jesus' character. Is their lifestyle matching what they're preaching? We also need to determine this and use this this discernment on a congregational level. It's not just leaders. Jude is talking about people coming into the midst of their assembly and teaching them. Well, that could be on the official level, or it could just be people wanting to join a congregation. Now, I'm not saying you have to turn away most people and only accept those who are godly and perfect people because, like, you're going to have an empty church, right? <laughs> So, but we do need to be listening to people who and what they're sharing amongst the congregation. And so, congregation members need to do the same thing. Is what this person sharing with me, is, is it according to God's Word? Does their life line up with what they're saying? And that way, then the congregation and the leadership become lovingly and mercifully self-policing. You know, you don't want to turn it into a police state, and we certainly don't want to unleash the gift of suspicion, right? Where there's a heretic behind every bush, and we don't have to call somebody to the carpet every time they say something that might be a little off base. We're talking about people who are dedicated to teaching the wrong thing, or people who are convinced of the wrong thing and refuse to consider other points and actually being brought back into line with what Scripture says or how we should be living. That's the problem that we find in Jude. Dr. J. Christensen, it's been a joy to sit across the table from you this uh, this day. I can't wait till next week when we actually will conclude this study we're doing in this itsy-bitsy book called Jude. Dr. J. Christensen, it's been a pleasure just to sit across the table from you here in the coffee shop, and I can't wait until next time we get together. want the truth today? Dr. Jay Christensen is the truth barista and the founder of High Beam Ministry. Jay is a creative person who wants to use the setting of an imaginary cafe to produce a series of radio and internet programs that confront the issues of our day through the lens of the Bible. The Truth Barista was the avenue that was developed to communicate truth using the Bible as the source of our information. The Truth Barista is a production of High Beam Ministry and can be found online at highbeamministry.com.